Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Jake Strand. And I'm Tracy McRae. We've all heard the advice about avoiding Lyme disease. If you walk through the wooded areas or grassy areas where it's prevalent, you should do the following. Use insect repellent, cover your exposed skin, and check yourself thoroughly once you return home. If you see a tick, pluck it off your skin with tweezers or maybe burn the match a little bit. No! 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 no. <laughs> oh, that's old. See, we're going to learn something this today. <laughs> we are. <laughs> and make sure to keep an eye out for that bullseye-shaped rash and flu-like symptoms. You will learn something today, Dr. Strand. <laughs> and also, I've got that, ugh, I hate talking about ticks. Anyway, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, about 30,000 cases of Lyme disease are reported each year, making it the most common vector-borne illness in the U.S., and the number of Lyme disease cases has tripled in the last 20 years. You might be wondering if Lyme disease has become so common, why isn't there a vaccine for it? And the person to answer it is here today, the director of Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group, Dr. Gregory Poland. Welcome back to the uh, program, Dr. Poland. Thank you, Tracy. Good to be here. You can tell that Dr. Strand has never done a tick show before <laughs> because he talked about burning a tick. So let's just start right there. No. Why should you not burn a tick? Do not burn a tick. You will burn you. <laughs> Not so much the tick. Having done that, yes, he will. But, but what Jake said at the beginning was exactly right. Take a tweezers and just pull it straight out. Um, and the faster you get it out, the better. After about 24 hours, we get worried that uh, the tick has had enough time to, I hate to use the word, but regurgitate those bacteria into you, and they cause a variety of diseases, one of which is Lyme disease. By the way, that estimate of 30,000 cases is probably tenfold too low. I saw you flinch when I read that. Yeah. So it's tenfold oh, yeah. too low? It's probably about 300,000 new cases a Holy year. Holy moly. And, you know, right along the Mississippi River Valley where mm -hmm. we live, mm -hmm. and then the East Coast are really the epicenters of these tick-borne diseases. So not along the southern part of the United States? Not so much. All I mean, right. every state has had cases, sure. but... Now, are, are Lyme disease cases tripling or... Are we just getting better at finding it, diagnosing it? Both. Okay. Um, we are better at diagnosing, and, and there's more awareness about it. But there actually are more people outside. Their uh, tick habitat has expanded. I mean, look at the deer around here. Mm -hmm. um, and there are new species. I don't know if you've heard about this, but in the last few months, the first new species of tick identified in the U.S. in 50 years was identified, and it's an Asian longhorn tick that is unbelievably prolific, 2,000 eggs at a time. They found, this is going to make your head crawl, they, a vet walked into a pen, looked at this sheep, and the ears were encrusted Stop. with ticks. He says he was in there about three minutes. They had he had over a thousand ticks on him. Holy moly! And so, is that in this part of the country too, or where not is that? Yet. It's eight states along the Northeast, but in the Midwest here, we got two new viruses that have been identified: so-called Heartland virus and Bourbon virus. So <laughs> there are there are lots of new viruses and tick-borne illnesses being identified. So. We don't, as you said, we don't have a Lyme vaccine. There's a company working on one, but it's been very contentious because of anti-vaccine mm -hmm. sentiment with the last vaccine that we had. So, I mean, this is really, you know, you can take this, this is either really frightening stuff or this is what we might start seeing as we, like you said, as uh, we deal with getting into new habitats, people being yeah. outside more with um, you know, new species being introduced, certainly in lots of parts of the country we deal with invasive species. What can people do to be better prepared for some of these new ticks that are coming along or, or yeah. how, to, how to become prepared for that? Well, everything I'm going to tell you helps, but it's not the full answer. We need a vaccine. Yeah. We need a way to prevent this. So what we can do at the current time is in your home, in your area, keep the grass mowed, keep the bushes back. If you are out in, uh, these ticks are what are called questing ticks, meaning they sit on the tips of grass and they wait for a mammal to go by mm. and boom, they latch on to you. So you want to wear long pants, long sleeves. Who wants to do that in the summer? Yeah. Use tick repellents. And as you said, check, check yourself afterwards. But it's very hard. Some of these ticks are the size of a poppy seed. 
Yeah, and I'd be curious, you know, you mentioned some preventative measures besides kind of wearing the long pants in the summer. Are there anything to this? I've been reading about this more in the paper about combinations of both repellent and things like permethrin. Yes. Are there better combinations that you well, see? Well, permethrin is actually very effective, um, but especially uh, the permethrin impregnated clothing where you wear long right. pants, okay. tuck it in mm-hmm. your s- socks, wear boots, those all help, but they're not perfect. Yeah. And how, how, oh, I was just, how, how is it that we've got a Lyme disease, a vaccine for dogs, but not for people? Yeah, it's, there was a, if I use baseball parlance, we had a Lyme disease that was sort of a double or a triple, but not a home run or a grand slam. And there was a false hypothesis that the vaccine was causing arthritis, which is absolutely not true. It has been looked at and looked at. I've published on this. There is no evidence for this. But class action lawsuits and anti-vaccine sentiment got to the point where the companies, the company that made this wasn't selling very much, and they said, not going to make it anymore. Hmm. Yeah. It, when, if that stuff is able to be... Um, alleviated to some degree how close scientifically do you think we are for well the, for getting that? the next va- and and by the way the old vaccine protected you against the north american species mm-hmm. but not when you travel to europe so the new vaccine that's being developed will protect you against all of those they've finished uh, 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 the the second stage of testing now they'll go into phase three testing so it's still going to be a while okay. five plus years I've been trying to uh, figure out exactly what vector-borne illness means, and I'll just <laughs> say I don't know. I don't know what I don't understand what that phrase means. It's a secret that you learn in medical school, <laughs> Tracy. Uh, well, I know the two of you know it. <laughs> what it means is that there's a vector, whether it's a mosquito, a tick, something other than a human, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they have a disease that can be transmitted to you. So the way it works with ticks is the tick bites. Reg- uh, sucks on your blood that blood gets mixed with the bacteria in its gut it then attaches to the next person and regurgitates that into the skin and these little bacteria called borrelia get released in there and begin disseminating through the body the worst we've heard about you know not just lyme disease but we've heard about a lot of these vector-borne illnesses recently Mm. and and thinking certainly about zika virus where are things with zika it's sort of really um, hit a panic for a, n- a number of months, and it seems like things have calmed down. Yeah, but that, you know, this is the problem with, uh, you know, the media and science. It did, and that's what it's done a- in every outbreak that we know of, only to reoccur or yeah. to reoccur somewhere else. So our group is actually working uh, on a Zika vaccine, and we just uh, developed a partnership with NIH, who's also developed one. So uh, we think we can develop one. We think it'll be, you know, hopefully safe and effective. But we're at risk. Uh, there are definitely cl- climate changes that are occurring that include the U.S. The mosquito species that carries Zika, believe it or not, has been found in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's hard to believe. Mm-hmm. But that whole southern rim, we have other mosquito-borne diseases like dengue. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we've got some real issues that are going to have to be Uh, further looked at. We're not sure why Zika didn't become established in Miami. They had indigenous cases, but that doesn't mean it won't in the future. In the past, we have heard about co-infections, or that's a newer phrase. What is a co-infection? What does that mean? Yeah, good question, Tracy. What that means is that when you, for example, get a tick bite, You're not at risk for just one infection, but co-infections means more than one. So you could have two or three, and this is the ticks are notorious for this. So you may make a diagnosis of Lyme disease, for example, but you may actually be infected with two or even three different types of bacterial species that have to be considered and treated. Fortunately, the treatment is usually good for all three of the more common ones, but not necessarily, and you got to check. Is that why sometimes people can have Lyme disease but not have that bullseye rash? Well, that's for a different reason. Not everybody gets that classic bullseye rash, but about 75 80% do. I would say, though, a couple of years ago, there was people that would go undiagnosed with Lyme disease. I mean, it seems like doctors are getting a lot better at figuring it out. Is it because the testing is getting better? The testing is better, and I think perhaps more is the awareness. 
particularly in, in areas like Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Northeast, where there are a lot of cases. Okay. We've been talking about vector-borne illnesses and vaccines with Mayo Clinic vaccine expert, Dr. Gregory Poland. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll discuss the problem of vaccine hesitancy. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Jake Strand. And I'm Tracy McRae. In 2000, the U.S. declared that measles had been eliminated. But as of today, the CDC is monitoring measles outbreaks in 21 states. Holy smokes. How can previously eradicated diseases return? The problem is vaccine hesitancy. Back with us to discuss is the director of the Vaccine Research Group of Mayo Clinic, Dr. Gregory Poland. Vaccine hesitancy. Is that because measles is back and is that for real? It's for real. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have a minor issue with in some people, they don't respond well to the vaccine. But the big elephant in the country's living room is this vaccine hesitancy. People who look to inappropriate sources for medical information and get false information. The big one, of course, has been that somehow measles vaccine causes autism which absolutely is not true. It's been disproven. 26 studies across uh, 10 countries across two decades. No one can find any evidence of this. Well, and because I always just tell people, the the guy who wrote that report has come back and said, no, it was not, yeah. I was lying, it wasn't true. Well, he was stripped of his medical license. Right. And, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is the county that he lives in has the lowest immunization rate among school children of any county in the U.S. Wow. Well, and it it's interesting that people would believe when he said you shouldn't, but now when he says, well, I was lying, it's yeah. been stripped of yeah. his... <laughs> now no one wants to believe that, yeah. but they want to believe the lie. There's a conspiracy yeah. psychology in there, isn't there? Yeah, my daughter, in fact, is a psychologist, and she and I have written on this topic together and lectured on it. I, I guess the bottom line is, you know, there's a few people that you're never going to change their mind. But I believe most people, most parents, really do want to do the right thing for mm -hmm. their child or their family member, and they're confused. Why would you look to some celebrity that maybe went to high school versus, you know, Dr. Strand, who's, mm -hmm. or myself, who's mm -hmm. been through umpteen years of training? I spend my life doing research in this area. But it's very, very hard uh, to convince people that, healthy people that they should do something now to protect their health in the future. Well, and, you know, it's interesting you bring up that, that point. And you know, we see this a lot with other types of medicines, medicines that, you know, are being used to treat things that we may not notice the symptoms of, mm -hmm. whether that's hypertension or high cholesterol for many years. It, there's also, I, you know, I think I'm curious, I've heard from a lot of uh, parents um, when I've lived in other parts of the country of this idea of, you know, I'm, I'm, when I have a kid, there's so little control that I have, I got to find something to control. And maybe this is one way to, to do that. It, it's just too bad, unfortunately, that people who really do care and want to do the right thing are getting all these mixed messages and and uh, and people are getting harmed because of it. Well, there's kind of, the, we've, we've noticed psychologically two, sort of two kinds of parents. The sin of omission or commission. I'll hear a parent say, if I give this vaccine to my child and something happens, I'll never forgive myself. And the other parent who says, if I don't protect my child with this vaccine and something happens that I could have prevented, mm -hmm. I'll never forgive myself. Very hard right. to mm -hmm. move either one either way. Yeah. Can you explain how an outbreak of measles works? I mean, it's not, just explain so how that works. So measles is a virus, and mm -hmm. it turns out that it is the most contagious human virus known, hmm. the most contagious. So you have to have about 96% of the population immune in order to prevent an outbreak. So you've got people who never got infected and are older, so they never got the vaccine. You've got this growing segment of the population who rejects the vaccine. Now a case gets imported, like the famous Disneyland outbreak, mm -hmm. and you got all these kids there, whether it's school uh, or, or a amusement park, whatever it is, that are susceptible. If somebody had been in this room with measles eight hours ago and you were susceptible and walked in, you'd get infected. And that's, that is a <laughs> pretty, yeah. no wonder it's one of the yeah. worst. 
Uh, and unfortunately, even today, measles kills about one to three out of a thousand people that get it. It is not a benign childhood disease. And, you know, I wonder, thinking through, I, I imagine probably people in the medical profession, physicians included, have not helped ourselves by, uh, I think like you nicely mentioned, labeling people who don't want the vaccine as uncaring or yeah. stupid, yeah. Um, as opposed to engaging in a decision, you know, shared decision-making model. What are some things that physicians can do or other clinicians can do even now to help combat vaccine hesitancy? I, you know, I, I may be biased here, but my daughter came up with a great model called the Preferred Cognitive Style and Decision-Making Model. Oh. What it basically <laughs> says is our job as, as healthcare providers is understand the preferred cognitive style. That means how does, how, do, how does my patient make decisions? And the onus is on us to change our style to meet their needs. Yeah. And that's been effective. But doesn't, but doesn't if, if, like I said earlier, the conspiracy part of it, yeah. Um, those are the hard ones. Yeah. <laughs> and I think those people are, it's even more important because not only do they say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to vaccinate, vaccinate my kids, yeah. but they are out yeah. to make sure no one vaccinate, vaccinates their kids. So yeah. the herd, immu hard, the herd immunity takes a really big hit too. You're absolutely right. And well, uh, the way I've dealt with that is I say, what are you most expert in? They'll tell me. I said, well, let's just go on the internet here. So you absolutely know this field. Oh, absolutely. Let's go on and we'll find all kinds of nutty things on there, you know, claiming conspiracies, et cetera. And I'll say, this is what we face. Yeah. You've got to make a decision about where does wisdom lie with scientists and people who study this or celebrities. It'll be interesting when we understand autism more. Mm what that will do to people who, to yeah. vaccine hesitancy. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think the, the big thing that's happening is people that were involved in that movement are recognizing this is not what the cause is. The advantage being, okay, now we can move to putting our money and our resources into figuring out what is causing this. Yeah. When we think about other ways that um, people can think about um, vaccines coming down the pike and how to approach that with an mm -hmm. open mind, are, are there, I know that's part of the reason I asked this question is because there's been a, this cloud over vaccine research mm -hmm. that slows down progress. So what things are on the horizon that we might be able to look forward to if we can continue to combat this misinformation? Well, it's a very, I mean, it's a great question, but a very difficult one to answer because the real answer lies in improving the scientific literacy of the culture. And that's a long-term job. It starts in grade school. Yeah. The importance of science. And I think there are so-called nudges that can happen. For example, um, when you say to a uh, insured population, if you get your flu vaccine, because of the data we have that says you're gonna be healthier and our costs will be lower, you get flu vaccine, you get a $100 discount on your insurance, guess what, they do it. <laughs> <laughs> And probably, yeah, I think that's a great point because probably you wonder that the effectiveness of that financial inducement to some state laws that are coming down to say, look, we're gonna we're not gonna have philosophical objections yeah, to vaccines that's, anymore. That's a good point. State laws can help yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned we were talking about Zika, the research that you have ongoing, and I want to finish up here talking about vaccine research. But by the time we figure this out, I know the last time that you were on, we talked about this. By the time you figure out a vaccine for mm -hmm. Zika. Won't the mosquitoes have changed enough or that disease changed enough that it will? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we've, not, we've not seen that in mosquito species. We've not seen major changes in Zika. What, where we do see changes is in what kind of population is it infecting. So while our research may or may not directly benefit people in the U.S., it may benefit the next, say, third world country mm -hmm. where an outbreak would occur. And finally, what's, what's on the vaccine horizon? Well, the uh, Zika vaccine is on the horizon. A Lyme vaccine is on the horizon. Um, there is now a new uh, shingles vaccine that actually got released in January. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of progress. There's a lot of work in vaccines against cancer. So uh, lots, of, lots of interesting Exciting things field. that over the next decade or two will pan out. We've been talking about vaccine hesitancy and research with the director of Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group, Dr. Gregory Poland. Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Poland. Thank you.